other wow. brothers. I don't know if you can understand why it's called that. <laughs> That's what it's called. When you use a triangle bandage, the majority of the time, in the short side, you tie a little love knot. Okay. And this is what that is for. It creates a little love pocket for the arm. Okay. So it goes right there, and then you can put that right in the elbow. And there it is. It just creates, oh, so nice. Okay. So when you're doing a sling, sorry, you should make it so that it's like, here, I'm going to have to pull this guy back. Look at that. It supports her arm. It is a sling. I'm pulling your hair. I apologize. Okay. So there is a sling. Okay. Now, if there is an injury to the clavicle and you are splinting because of that, you're putting the sling on, it does not behoove you to put a sling that's bearing the weight of the arm pressing against the broken clavicle. So you modify the way you do it. And this is what it looks like. You come around the back this time. And there you go. See that? There is no pressure on the clavicle. Okay? So we'll just leave it like this, but this isn't the one you use all the time. This is the one that's used just for the um, clavicle injury. That is a sling. Now we have something called a swap. The down and dirty way to do it is to take your triangular bandage, okay, make it into a kind of strip, okay? You come around the other side. Get friendly with your patient, okay? You need to go so that it's under the wrist and on the arm, and then you tie that right there. Why do I go under? Oh, I just break my triangular bandage. Why do you go under the wrist? This is why. Try and go like this a little bit. Can't do it. Weird. If you go like that, now do it. Like this. Oh, look at that. It is not secure. Okay? Now, if there is another technique, which is a, a, what I call double love, you take another triangular bandage and you put it up on top of the shoulder, like that, and then you go underneath the wrist and you tie it on this side. I'm trying to let you guys see, so I'm trying to keep out of the way. What that does is it creates more area of contact. That felt more secure. And that is a little, kind of giving them a little bit more of a hug. Mm. Okay? If you're not used to this technique, it's a little bit harder to do than the down and dirty one that I showed you the first time. Both are acceptable. Both work. This one is a little bit better as far as stabilization. Got it? Okay. So there you go. That is your swing and swap and a splint. If you give it a little bit of shape, a little bit of a U-shape, okay, kapow, it is now stiff. Okay? And don't make any jokes. All right. I made a little place for her to put her hand on it. See that? And I've elbowed it like that. Boom. There is a thing that if you want, if their arm is broken pretty badly and it's angulated, I would measure on the other arm so you're not manipulating this arm too much. So there it is. I've got this on. Would you hold that with the other hand? There you go. Thanks. You can use bandaging. Okay. When you go and you bandage, make sure you leave a space so that you can check the pulse and motor and sensory after. Also make sure you come up and go between the thumb and the hand and across the top or it will not secure the wrist. Are you hearing that? That is crucial. Now I'm just, again, I'm not, have, I'd have somebody stabilize this while I do it. So there you go. Then you would put on your sling and swath afterwards and then you would check pulse. Motor, can you wave your fingers a little bit? Okay, and then sensory, what finger am I touching? Pinky, good. Okay, 
So this gives it the splinting. You get the sling and swath, and it goes on and you get it on there. The last one on your long bone stabilization. Hold your arm like that. Hold that like that. Right for him, hold. This is the down and dirty. Remember, that's what I teach. Okay? So you get this through here. You do not go around the arm. Okay? You tie this together, creating a splint sandwich. That's with an M, sandwich. Okay? After you do that, you get a couple more. You go to the top, you tie around this end, right next to the arm so that it's close. Right next to the arm so that it's close. Okay, there you go. Elbow is now secure. Do the try and straighten your arm. If you, you you move it a little bit, but not much. They are now splinted. What would I do now? Swap. TMS. Pulse motor and sensory. What am I doing? Okay, good. Okay? And always do that. Alright? So that is the elbow. That is the exact same technique for the knee. So on the knee you would do it here, here, and here. Same technique. Exactly. Alright? Can you swap it? Huh? Nope. Yeah, well you could, but elbow doesn't need to. So why would I need to swap? What is a rule for a joint? Remember how Chris beat that to death? What is a rule for a joint? What do you secure? The bone above, the bone below. The bone above and below. The bone above and below are what? Immobilized. Mm -hmm. Woo! Win. Okay? Now there are other techniques where you wrap and you do the special changey zigzag and wano with thing, and they're really cool. And they work. But this is down and dirty and super simple. This is the key, this first one in the middle right here. That holds that in place, and it also creates that space where they, their elbow sits against it. And then when you put it there and there, they're, they're not going to be able to move it. Okay? So super easy. And again, like I said, there are super fancy techniques with more rappy schmappies that are functional. And you know who's a pro at that? A gal named Michelle that I was talking to on the phone on your phone just a second ago. In Wobb County, they only have two calls a year, so they have time to figure this stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> God, I wish. Oh, Michelle's like, oh, yeah. I told Micah that, uh, like, do you told her what She's like, I kind of threw you in the it was, and uh, you're on the schedule. I'm like, how the hell did I get a job I didn't apply for? She's <laughs> like, oh, no, don't worry. Don't it's, worry, it's fine. It's slow down here. Yeah, whatever. And? I brought my black cloud. Uh -uh. So, you can pick up your glasses. Put the pen right here on your cheek, like this, okay. and hold it up here so I can work with it. Okay. Your job is to not let it slip into your eye so I don't damage your eye. So, this is a technique that you would use on the actual impaled object or around a cup or something to protect that. There is a technique that a lot of folks use that I'm not a fan of. But it is a valid technique. You make donuts out of these. And then you slide it on like that. But if it's stuck in their eye, without fail, you're going to bump that. So I'm not a big fan, but it is valid technique. If you really practice at that, it's actually good. But my goal is not to damage, okay? So you make one nice wrap going underneath the eyebrow, okay? And underneath the occiput, which is the bone in the back of your, your skull, you come around and you take a wrap gently around the pen and you come right back to the place you were at. See that? Go to the other side and do the exact same thing the other way. You're being gentle now, okay? And you do that several times. If you need to get another thing of Curlex, please do. Now let go of the pen. That's just sitting on her cheek. If you do a whole other curlex like that, you are 
making that secure. The best is to put something over the top of it like a giant big gulp cup or something. The problem with that is that generally the cup you have is a Dixie six ounce cup that will not cover anything, impaled anything. Okay? So if you have a nice big gulp cup, you know, unless it has Diet Coke in it, because we do not want them to get addicted to the worst substance on the planet. <laughs> Any other drink and it's great. Okay? Put it on there over the cup and then do this exact same wrap around that cup to keep that cup secure. Got it? Do you do cover both eyes? Yes, that, but I didn't have the glass. Okay. Thanks for telling me that, by the way. You guys hear that? And why would I cover both eyes? So, mm -hmm. All right, now let's have some fun. Let's do chin strap. This is for any ouchie on the head side of the face. Okay? Put it underneath, come around the back. Now notice how I've got the curlex so that it peels out really nicely. If you do it this way, you're going to end up dropping it. Make sure that it peels, that it just comes out really nicely like this. Okay, so once you get a nice wrap going, you come around twice, come up over the top, down around the chin, and then back up to the top. Never go to the back from there because now you're putting pressure on the throat. Okay, so straight up, around, and secure it. Woohoo! Why you have the chin strap? Mostly to mock your patient because <laughs> it looks funny. But other than that, what it does is this part that's just sitting there, if you don't have the chin strap, it'll just pop off at the slightest touch. Now it's been anchored by the chin. If you have side lacerations on the face or on the side of the head, you would do more chin than you would head. Copy? Okay. And then doing a bunch of those, if you need to, oops, sorry, if you need to do more, then you do more. You need to do more critics, and you do more critics. Um, and don't forget, you're putting gauze to provide pressure on wherever the cut is, the 4x4. Four four. I've got those down there, but I didn't use them. Now this one's called dog ears, or as I like to call it, the George Washington. You'll see why in a second. So, oh, it'll still work on here. So what you do is you dangle this right down to the shoulders. You go right up over the top, and you make some doggy ears. Aww. Kill the dog. Anyway. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Yep, and now it looks like the little wigs they wear in British courts still today. Okay, so now you've got your dog ears. You get another bandage, and you have the exact same wrap as before. Right underneath the eyebrows, around the back. And you want this one really fairly tight. The second time around, I want it to be pretty darn tight. Once you do that, would you reach up and hold this with your finger? You take your doggy ears, snug them down to create pressure on that wound on top, Fold them up, super cool, huh? Yeah, and it's fun to do, I'm not a big fan, but what it does is that creates a little bit of pressure on top. If they have any type of neck injury though when you're pulling down, not a great idea. But it is a functional and valid bandage. One time we did that to one of my patients who was pissing me off. Got like a tiny little scratch right here. And I'm like, oh, let me bandage it for you. And walk around for the rest of the day. And everybody was just giving him so much shit. Because he had a huge bandage on his <laughs> yeah. head for a scratch. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Um, eye bandage. We didn't even do the basic bandage. We didn't even do the first two basic ones. Bandage. This is on your checkoff list, by the way. Um, the one that you have to sign off. This is a spiral. You start from distal and work proximal. So say they have a cut on their forearm. Okay, well let's do the whole nine yards this time. 
you have a 4x4 four four on their Wunda. You can just put your finger on that. You start distal, and you get a nice securing wrap. Then you come up, cutting the bandage in half with each wrap. Do you see that? Mm. Now that you have done that and then secured it on top, if you want, you can come back down, or you can stop there. Okay? I like to make it a nice double beauty here. And by the way, beautiful bandages are better because they're more functional. That's the only reason. Yours will not look as awesome as mine. That's okay. So that is a spiral bandage, basic. Okay? Do you check for with that? Again, yes. Um, not, as, not as important as doing it with splinting, but still necessary because if you're really excited when you're doing that bandaging, you could create a small tourniquet. Okay, question. Yes. So they taught us in but when you're coming back over the second time, you can twist it for like. Easy, pressure. you're jumping ahead of Soros Rex and can't suit. <laughs> but would you still like that still be functional? Kids. Hey. So what she's talking about is a pressure bandage, which is another check off on your thing. Right here, here is where your wound is, and it's still bleeding a lot, okay? As you come around, you would do a twist right here, right over where the wound is. You'd come around again and do another twist right over where the wound is, okay? Being pretty tight. The pressure comes with the following wraps. If you do not wrap around those twists, it does not create the pressure you want. What that does is provide specific pressure right to the wound where it's bleeding. And it's like putting pressure on it with your hand or your thumb or whatever. Okay? That's what it's like. So that's a twisty. That's a pressure bandage. I can't believe you said teaching and woofer in the same sentence. <laughs> Bandage. What this is for is if they have an injury on a joint, like say in their antecubital fossa or something fancy right there. Okay? So they've got an injury right there. Hold that one a figure eight bandage looks like this. And it can also be anywhere around this, but this is for a joint. What it does is you create, you get your anger bandage again starting distal, moving to proximal. And then you come across that at an angle and go to the top above the joint, do an anchor, then come across, and now you just do figure eights, back and forth. And you're like, okay, that's super cool, what in the crap is it for? Allow me to show you. Bend your arm. Okay, pull it back. Do it again. Do it again. Look, it stays in the same spot. Magical. If you were to do that and you had a wrap over that elbow, it would start to slide, go away from wherever. But that creates mobility. Okay? So there you go. Figure eight. Yes, but I'm going to hand it to my super duper assistant over here that has good skills. <laughs> okay, so. Bandage, bandage, bandage. I. Oh, super duper junk. If you have a bunch of these and someone's got something sticking out of some, somewhere, arm, whatever, um, say they've got something impaled in their arm, if you pile these up around said object, pin again, so hold it right there. If you pile these up like this, and then crisscross and go this way, and crisscross and go this way, and create a giant tumor of a bandage, that will secure it. Super good technique. Okay? 
So I forgot about that one. So I'm glad. This is what's actually pen. This is my pen. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, splint, splint, splint. Leg. Okay. Have the seat on the ground for you. So here we go with the leg. Suppose tip fit broken down there. Okay. And just for fun, we're going to say it's in this position, which they usually are when you do a tip fit. So here's the thing, when you are doing this, what is the rule of a broken bone? You will immobilize what? The joint above and below. The joint above and below. This is the most common mistake. Okay? When they put on the splint, they leave it down about here. Okay? If you tie this right here, there's going to be complete mobility in that knee. So you want it to be long, up into the groin and up on the side like this. That will immobilize the knee. Also, you want to bring it up high on the foot so you can immobilize the ankle. If you just kind of go like this and pull that. So, you can use curlex, you can use triangular bandages, whatever you want. Oh, how's that going? Okay, so down on the ground like that. Right there. Cool. So, I like doing this with a triangular bandage to keep this up where it's supposed to be. I do the kind of joint thingy right here. That helps keep that in the place where it's supposed to be. It doesn't have to be super fancy, it's just helping it keep in position. Okay? So with your curlex, you do a nice little wrappy wrap around. Okay? And then go around your splint. Again, practice different techniques. Get it the way you want to so that you are securing that ankle. That is the most important thing down here. Whatever it takes to do that. That's why I'm going around the bottom of the foot and the top and the splints both. Okay? So, a little bit of movement of your ankle. It's kind of hard to move, isn't it? Yeah. There you go. Do you do this when they're on the gurney? On the who? On the or whatever. You street. probably would do it before you move them. Okay. But. If you do, you do. So, you go right here. Again, these are the down and dirties. You can use Curlix. Um, you can use triangular bandages. You can also use two SAM splints, one on each side. If your splints aren't long enough, say they were the shorter ones. Hold up the shorter one. The, okay? You can alternate them like this. So one's higher, one's lower. You can use only one on the outside if you want to. You can use the other leg as a splint if you want to. Check that out, huh? Splinting and bandaging is basically EMS arts and crafts. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> it's all that is well said. <laughs> if you did to the other leg, you get it, it to work and you still got a pulse. That's all about that. that when it cut off circulation. Where? To the other leg. So because you're tying on the knee and the ankle, would you check the back of the knee pulse and the... Nope, I would just check the distal. Okay, and where you check for this is right here. Behind the ankle, between the ankle bone that sticks out and the Achilles tendon. You reach up in there and push, and you feel a pulse. It's called posterior tibble. There's also dorsalis pedis, which is on the top, but that's harder to find. Unicorn. Yeah, and if you find it, Market. Circle it. Exit. So someone's like, what's that for? That's where their pulse is. They're like, oh, how about that? Super cool. And they don't have to look for it. Okay? So when they're checking pulse. So I would add one more triangular bandage for fun, closer to the knee, but not directly over the knee. I'm just not going to do that. So what this does is now you have got this secured. The higher up you go with this tie, the more secure you get. If you can go even up closer to the groin, do that. Okay? Um, sure. Definitely have the shoe off. Actually, I would cut it off. I wouldn't take it off. Yeah. Power saw every time. Just kidding. Do not do that. Everyone's like, what? 
That's right. She cut the shoelaces, created junk thing. And they generally whine about that when they're Air Jordans or their ski boots. Oh my gosh. Talk about criers. Don't hurt my super duper North Face $200,000 jacket. Well, you shouldn't have jumped off the cliff, dumbass. <coughs> I mean, silly guy. Silly goose. Silly goose, thank you. That's the one I'm looking for. Okay. So, as you are practicing these, remember arts and crafts. That's well said. Do you want to do caption as well? Yes. Oh. Last one. Ready? Is for mid femur fractures, mid shaft. So, a fracture right there, which is the most common place to fracture a femur. We get this a lot, the race tracks for the motorcycles. Yes. And we'll talk about why motorcycles happen. This one sucks. That one's slightly better. Okay, good. So, this is the broken femur. Or, or sorry, up here. Um, you want to measure on the other leg, put the other leg close to it. Where you want to measure is to with a butt. Thanks for being strapped. And you want to have it at least, at least eight inches past their foot. More is better. Okay? So you've got it right here. And then that's going to be good. Not right to there. Now. Very technical term in here. The booty shell. The booty shell. Right. Hold on. Right. <laughs> okay. So what you do is you have a very competent partner come over. And they are going to pull traction on that leg. <laughs> And what that's going to do is they're going to go, oh, bastard, and they're going to yell at you and call you all sorts of names. Okay? once you get that traction, they just look like. Yeah, they're like, oh. It's really funny, actually. Try not to laugh. So I'm going to put the ankle strap on. And that is not working. That is the wrong. It's broken. It's been ripped. I'm like, there is no way that is an adult ankle strap. <laughs> There's a real one. <laughs> was that Mr. Bill? I was like, no. Oh. Oh, you guys don't even know who Mr. Bill is. I shouldn't have even said that. Now I'm going to have to explain it. Okay, this doesn't have this, the, the D ring, but we'll wink it work. Okay, so, there you go. You put it around, you get that ankle strap on. It should have it so that the heel strap comes right over underneath, underneath the heel. That's perfect. So then what you do is you try and work this in. To make this work, you have to put it right up against the ischial tuberosity, which is your butt bone, right here. Anyone close to me have a high pants? Can you turn around? I'm going to gently touch your buttocks. <laughs> This is where you put it, and you're going to shove it right up and against there. If you do not put it against that, it does not work. The end. Okay? So, you get it up in there. Go ahead, just kind of wait. Yeah. And I'm gonna... They never help you that. Okay. Okay, so there I am. I'm putting it right up in there tight. And then I have the magical groin strap. Okay? This one is a worn out groin strap. Like, tell them to adjust. That's right. You get it right. Yeah, homie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you're doing this groin strap, something that makes people super excited when you're testing is if you put padding on the inside to protect the femoral artery, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of useless, but they get all excited about it, so do it. Would you cut it off? Would yeah, you... That would cut off the circulation, yes. Okay, can you lift that up? I think we got a messed up strap here. I should have checked before. There it is. Okay. So you do not go over the brake and you do not go over the knee. So knee, brake, right here. Actually, nope, my bad. First you need to do this. You would put it on the D-ring, which is the metal thing right there. Once I get it on, I'm going to tighten it. So it's so you always want to take in off a the second shoe you're going to fill it. Yeah. You fill it to pull them on your ass? Yeah. Yeah, is it good yet? I'm tired? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the thing. Exactly. 
what Tatiana was talking about happens. They're like, oh, shut up with it, oh, is it, I don't it. And that means you have taken those bones from here to here. And they're like, okay, I'm better. Can I go home? No. <laughs> okay? Is that like kind of your only indication? Or yes. And it'd be so obvious, it's hilarious. Yeah. Now, we should use another couple of straps, but they're not on here. We would have one more right here. And then once you do that, what do you check? Bolts. Bolts, which is totally covered, so I can't do that. <laughs> okay, I found it. There it is. There's pulse. Motor. Can you move your foot a little bit? Which toe am I piercing? There you go. Pulse, motor, and sensor. This is a traction splint. When do you use it? Mid shaft femur. Not at any other time. This is not a device to just pull traction on something. Mid shaft femur. How do you transport or put this into a Good question? Lens. So, <laughs> once you close doors, you have about this much room between the end of the gurney and your door. So, how would you put someone in there? Leg in the air. Put it up. Yeah, towards the. the there's two. There's two solutions. Flip the patient around. Have them oh. upside down on the cot. Or if they're super tall and that doesn't work. Bungee cord the back door is open. So I've only done that a few times. The guy was six seven. Anyway, okay, so how do you get this onto the gurney? You go you one, two, three, two. Lift your patient up and um, yeah. on there. Usually what I do is I have one person managing the leg, and that's their only job. They're holding this and then everyone else lifts. And you're usually on a backboard as well, so it makes it easier. Okay, so let me say one thing. Watch this. That's how you release tension. Um, one of the problems that people have with this is this actually was done wrong, but I didn't want to take the time. See this little bar right here? You want it on this side of that bar. Because if you do it that side, you're going to cause damage to the strap. And it will probably break when you're halfway done transporting. And uh, then their femur goes back, and then they make their femur artery, and then they bleed to death. And someone's sad somewhere. Okay, so this is the thing. Suppose now we go back to the tib fib fracture. So let's say it's angulated. It's like, like that. Okay, it's like, oh, that looks bad. So I go to check before I splint it pulse. No pulse. No pulse. I said, I'm to check this. I can't feel a pulse. You don't have to go over. She goes, no, I don't feel a pulse either. So I check their nails and like capillary refill. I'm like, man, that's super slow. There's no. You may hold traction manually on any limb that does not have a pulse one time. This is what it looks like. This is going to hurt a lot. Are you ready? <laughs> Here we go. Mm and then you gently release, check again, they might have a pulse. Yay! Splint, 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 check pulse motor and sensory, get them to the hospital. Or, they don't have a pulse. Okay. Then I would write a permanent magic marker on their leg, no effing pulse. Because you got to speak nurse language. There's no pulse. They go, no pulse. What does that mean? Oh, no effing pulse. Oh, they're saying there's no pulse there. Okay. I saw a hand. Where did I see a hand? Please. It will. However, that's not what we're concerned about. This one has so much muscle surrounding it that you have to keep the traction on it. The rest of them, you know, unless you're me, you don't have great big muscles in your arms. So, so what would pulse be enough so you can get the pulse back? Yeah. And that's all you want to do. What will pulling do? Like how it will realign that? everything that's in there broken oh. and out of place. Because you might be pinching off an artery with a broken bone, or the angle that your foot is twisted is pinching off that artery. So would okay. that like realign it? Yes. But we do not want to do what doctors do. They're like, this is from personal experience. 
Okay? They're like, hey, Phil, check this out. <laughs> okay? We don't do that. We pull one time. We release gently. We don't go, Pachow! okay? We gent gently release, and then we feel for the pulse to see if we have it. If we have a pulse, fantabulous. We did good work. If we don't, we probably still did good work, but it didn't work. It didn't fix the problem. So when you get there, you write, I generally write right on their skin, even if it's just with a ballpoint pen. No pulse. So that they go, what, what does that mean? That means no pulse. Where? In the lake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you guys think I'm joking, but I'm not. What is this mean? It's like, what's, what did he say in that movie? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? I don't understand. <laughs> okay, so that's how you do that. Okay, that's traction. If they don't have pulse in their wrist and they have a broken ulna, radius, humerus, traction would look like this. If it's up here, it would look like this. See that? Hmm? One time, release, check. Okay? One time. Did I say one time? One time. If you do it more than that, you risk damaging the artery permanently and risk bleeding them out and killing them. That's bad. All right? Thank you. Everyone give your hand. That was lots of stuff. Man. Any questions on any of that? Cataract. <laughs> the only thing with this one is you need time to do it. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move her leg in totally inappropriately for someone who has a broken leg. So don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to see how I put that right on her leg, right there. Did Michelle show you this one? Because this well, one we wrong. teach it all the time. I know it's awesome, <laughs> but I don't use it because it's it's, it's time it consuming time. and it's super comfortable. And it's really awesome, and I don't use it. <laughs> Will you hold that like that, please? So I don't have to keep fixing it. So she and I both work in rural areas, so there's a lot of times mm -hmm. where we throw them on the cot, and we've got an hour in the back of the room. Yeah, and you have a long transport, so comfort is a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're transporting from Wab all the way up to um, the baby factory, that's, that's at least an hour. And then if you're going to the U, that's... Another hour. Yeah, at two in the morning. Okay, so look at this. So I've got this sitting, so her leg is cradled in all of these triangular, triangle bandages. Okay. Then what you do is you come around like this, and then come up over the top. What? Mm -hmm. What's that? Now look how comfy that is. You're sitting in a little triangular cradle of love. <laughs> okay? And it's a super cool technique. I just don't ever use it. Wow. Somebody said the W word. There's a woofer in here. You can use that. <laughs> <laughs> if they say CMS or CSM or whatever that dumb thing is. Gamma. Whatever. Yeah. What I meant to say is don't ever say it again. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> okay, now I'm on the knee. I don't want to do that, so pretend that's not on the knee. What knee? Exactly. <laughs> what knee? Excuse me. And this one sometimes, depending on the size of the leg of your person, may not work on the top because the triangular bandages are only so long. So there you go, you're sitting in a giant triangular bandage of love. It's supported, it's really cool, and it's not too much longer than the other ones. But there's a lot of manipulation of the leg involved, a lot of movement. You have to have sometimes three people to get this done. Okay, especially if they're in a lot of pain, <coughs> calling you names and stuff. That's when you use your truckies, your firefighters. Yeah. So, you let them do you guys see how that worked? Mm -hmm. If you want to practice that one, that's a very valid band. <coughs> super comfortable.